Marvin Hemeyer. Today is April 13, 2004. This tape is about my life since I come up here in 1991. I am making this tape. Really didn't think it'd make any difference if I did make it, but a good friend of mine said I should make it. I mean, he said I should sit down in front of a videotape machine and do it, but you're just going to have to take my word that this is Marvin Hemeyer, serial number 503-689-471. I want to say right now, God bless me in advance for the task that I am about to undertake. Marv Hemeyer, he was from South Dakota, and uh, he served in the Air Force. He realized that he had a knack for welding, working on engines and motors. He was stationed in Colorado and decided to stay in Colorado when he got out of the Air Force. I moved up here in the fall in 1991 to kind of take a six-month vacation. I decided that, you know, I probably ought to buy some property up here to have something to do, so I uh, looked at this three lots, the two little cabins that I'm living in here right now, and had a beautiful view, and the price was really cheap, so I bought them. He worked at a muffler shop, moved up very quickly in the business. Uh, at some point, he just decided, heck, I can do this myself and he went out and set up his own muffler shops. He was able to have income from businesses that he had started mostly in northern Denver and Boulder area. You know, if you got a champagne income with a beer cake, you're gonna do well. And that's what I've always had. Always believed that's the way it was, should be. That's the only way I could get ahead. I'm sure he counted pennies in every endeavor he ever undertook, and he wanted to run businesses well so that they succeeded, and I think he cared about his craft. I knew of Marv Meyer because he ran a muffler shop in Granby. He did a lot of great work for people, ran that muffler shop for a lot of years. Uh, I even had work done at his shop. He had a reputation as being the best welder around. We'd put this truck together and then the box was bouncing and I took it down there and I said, hey Marv, what do you think? And he said, oh, I can fix that. And he just grabbed his welder and he, you know, it was done. Never broke, never, I mean, the guy was a hell of a welder. He had a great reputation in the town. I mean, he was an outdoorsman. He loved a snowmobile. I didn't ever meet anybody who disliked him. I call it successful. I think I was a very poor person most of my life. But I, I, for, for who I was and where I, what I was, I think I was a very rich man. And I'm thankful to God for giving me that life. I met Marvin in the Lariat Saloon in Grand Lake. I was there with a friend. He came in and he asked me out. I had not dated in five years, you know, my marriage had split up and um, but for some reason um, I said yes and we went out and started seeing each other for several years. He's all, he was old school to me. You know, men are, people, society doesn't allow that anymore. You know, he's a handshake, a handshake kind of guy to me. I mean, he was confident and I thought he was handsome and he was larger than life. I felt safe with him. It's kind of personal, but he was the first man that I was intimate with after my marriage. He was wonderful to me. He only met my children once and he never had children, as you know that we did quite a few road trips together and never a dull moment. Marv loved the snowmobile. Oh, 
call the Thursday group. Every Thursday, they take day off and go ride. Sometimes you have four guys. Sometimes you have 24 riders. Just a great bunch of guys to go out and ride with. Little Matty was the youngest. When I started riding with Marv and the Thursday crew, I was 16 years old. And these guys were 40, 50. You know, I couldn't drink with them. I couldn't do any of that stuff. I had to go home to mom and answer to mom still. Marv was, in some respects, he took me under his wing. He helped teach me how to snowmobile, work on snowmobiles. He's always a mentor and always helped, always gave. He was my best friend. I looked at him as my bigger brother. I let Marv lead unless it was someplace I knew better than him. Okay, that's where, we're, that's where we came from over there. This is right here where we're supposed to be. And that's where Stu went, way over there. <laughs> Marv made glove dryers. We had a Marv grill. Marv would take stock steel, bend it custom to every machine. You weren't a snowmobiler in Grand Lake unless you had a Marv bumper. And it would take down four-inch trees, five-inch trees, and you'd just keep going. That was a Marv bumper. Yeah, he was the king, yeah. If he got beat by anybody on the mountain, that was the last time he got beat by that person. He bought me my own Polaris that you know, taught me how to get off trail and when in doubt, gas it. <laughs> it's a kind of a community that in order for you to get ahead you have to keep the neighbor down it's not you know build yourself up on your own merit it's tear the other guy down Green County definitely at one time was the wild, wild west. We've modernized a tremendous amount, but it is not uncommon at all in the wintertime to have two weeks straight where the temperature doesn't get above 10 degrees. You have to be a little more independent, a little more willing to do without. You have to like small towns. You kind of live in a fishbowl to some extent because your neighbors kind of know your business a little more than they would be in the city. That can cause conflict. After a few months of living here, I happened to cross a piece of property down there in Grandy. And this was about a month before they were going to have this FDIC auction. Marv originally bought the property that he was on in a public auction. They were selling FDIC foreclosed properties. 3,000 square foot building, and had two acres of ground. They had a bid for $35,000 from some guy up in front. So finally they caught my bid, so I got I had a bid for 40 and this other guy jumped up on his chair. I've come to find out his name was Cody Docheff. Cody Docheff is the owner of Mountain Park Concrete. The Docheffs were looking for land upon which to put this concrete operation with an indoor batch plant. Docheff also showed up with Gus Harris. Gus Harris was his buddy there sitting beside him. Gus was sponsoring the whole financing on this thing, and Gus wasn't going to pay more than 50 grand for it. And I was waiting for him to bid, and he wouldn't bid. So I got the property. Marv says that after he got the property, he was accosted by Cody. This guy came back there and introduced himself to me about the rudest, most arrogant person. I mean, this guy's just a fucking asshole. Come back and just introduced himself by giving me a tongue lashing for about 10 minutes. I mean, this is the only guy of all the properties that sold before his that was doing any screaming at anybody during the auction. What I like about it here is we're in God's country. Why live anywhere else? But I don't like the way the counties run. There's a good old boys club. When he bought the property, it had nothing more than just a, a concrete mixer tank that was holding the sewage. In the summer of 92, they wanted me to be annexed into the water and sanitation district. So I said, great. I just expected it to go through. Ron Thompson was on the board for the sewer district. 
Ron was pretty outspoken in the, the board meetings, so he may have said things that upset Marv at that meeting and taken a leadership role in making the decisions they made. Well, as it turns out, the closest sewer main was many hundreds of feet away from Marv's property. So in order for Marv to hook onto that, he would have had to build a long service line from his property to the main. When he learned that to do all that was going to cost him anywhere from 60 to 70, maybe even $80,000, Marv was upset. They make you pay for the installation of the sewer line that you don't want, and then you have to still hook yourself up. That's life-changing money. Marv refused to do that. I never heard him talk bad about anybody but the people that did him bad. The good old boys club. He did not like them. I never had anybody sit there and plan to cut me out of a, an opportunity like the Thompsons did when they denied me access to the sanitation district. It doesn't make any sense other than that it was the good old boys patting each other on the back. Had they not done that, I can assure you, the outcome, the whole thing, would have been completely different. The Thompson family is what I'd call a Granby legacy family, a wealthy working family in the Granby area, making their money off of excavation, but also living off the fact that they owned a lot of the land just because they'd been here forever. The first Thompson clan that settled in Granby actually bought lodging properties and in the course of that, they bought little pieces of property around town. The Thompson formed their own excavation company. Dick Thompson was the son of the first Thompson family. Dick had several children. Ron was kind of a, a leading son in the family. Larry was kind of the older son who helped, and Gary went right along with him doing a lot of the excavation work. Gus Harris, and Cody Docha, and the powers that be the Thompsons, if they would have let me alone, I wouldn't have had this righteous anger that I have towards the Thompsons, their hierarchy, their attitude that they have left in that community for so many years, and so many people think like they do. Screw your neighbor. In Marv's eyes, the Thompson family was the epitome of the Granby establishment that did everything they could to thwart Marv. Well, I'm making lemonade out of lemons, you know. I just kept on about my business because this is a small community and, you know, I need to fit in. Life was pretty good and I was making a real good income out of there. And in 98, the town went and spot zoned the two acres directly south of me, which was illegal in Colorado. And because no one protested it within 30 days, it became law that they could do that. And this Dojeff guy, he's going to try to buy the property next door to the west of me and has a contract on it to purchase it. And they were going to be able to put this concrete plant right there next to all those houses downwind of the town. And Cody's motivation was to get back a barn. Well, I, I find this out too late. You know, I, mean, I was right in the dust tail of this whole operation, and that wasn't going to work. I didn't want no friggin' concrete plant next to me. There was opposition to the concrete plant, and we heard we had public hearings. Uh, I was acting mayor because the mayor and the mayor pro tem both had conflicts of interest, so I presided over the public hearings, and we allowed the public to come in, and it was a packed house. People spoke for it, for the service to concrete it would provide and there's lots of people that spoke out against it. Marv Hemar did a great job of arousing public sentiment in his favor against the batch plant. He felt that the batch plant would hurt his business. He claimed that there would be dust, that there would be noise, that there would be excess traffic. Who knew what they were gonna do to the water supply? He also made that argument on behalf of people in the neighborhood. Marv got a lot of these people to show up and basically say, we don't want it, we don't like it, what are you gonna to do to our neighborhood? They voiced a lot of the concerns that Marv was voicing. This went on for a series of three, four, maybe even five meetings. And there'd be discourse and, and, and discussion and, and Cody would jump up because he was so upset. He, he has, he's a fiery guy. The town ultimately approved 
Cody's batch plant down there, but with a host of, of conditions, you know, the typical things that you see. I think I read the motion, you know, the whereas and the wherefores and all that stuff to approve the batch plant. And it was at that meeting in 99 where Marv promised he'd fight him the whole way. In nature, wolves, coyotes, they have their territory. A mother, just look at the mother. She will fight to protect her young. And a male, a male will definitely protect his territory. If he doesn't, he'll be overrun. Now, if an animal will do this, why wouldn't a man? In the meantime, the town is cracking down hard on Marv, saying there's a serious issue with your water and sewer. And he ended up going to Granby Municipal Court. Judge Noriyuki was presiding. She said, we find you in violation. We're going to give you a deferred judgment, however. And you can't use the property for anything until you're hooked up to water and sewer. You have to connect. But 400 feet's a long ways. There could be a piece of property in the way. In this case, there was. Cody's. He needed the easement. Cody wasn't going to give him the easement. The town contacts him and says, we're going to fine you $100 a day because you're operating a business and you're not hooked up to a sewer. Marv wrote a check to the town, and he wrote on the memo line, cowards and liars department. And to add insult to injury, they sent it back and said, the amount is incorrect. Well, this clearly angered Marv. He shows up at the town hall. They kept finding him because he was the out-of-towner. He came up here in small town. In Marv's mind, this was just another example of the town not treating him fairly. The Dochefs were moving forward with their proposal. Suddenly, Marv shows up with an attorney, and then he's saying, I think that we've caught you in a mistake. The town board was stunned. They called an executive session, kicked everybody out. They said, well, we're going to put everything on hold until we can decide what we're going to do. The attorney made us be very dot the I's, cross the T's. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we did, we were right on the money with. They came back and said, we're going to let them restart from square one so that we can do it right this time. As a last ditch effort, Mar filed a lawsuit in district court. But the Dochefs, they're serious about building this batch plant as quickly as possible. They're moving forward as if there's not any barrier to their progress at all. There's heavy equipment operating at the soon-to-be batch plant site. Marv is sitting here watching all this happening, and I think he's just stewing about it. You put yourself in my shoes and tell me how you would feel realizing that you've wasted 10 years of your life because of someone's malice. He's putting out money, and he's getting shut down every corner, and then it was to nothing. I don't know how much he spent. I know one time he had 150 grand into it. And I said, well, you shouldn't have spent that much money on these assholes, because you can't fight the government. Nine months later, the court made its ruling on the lawsuit. Judge Doucette dismissed the lawsuit completely. Suddenly, Marv had nobody on his side. My attorney, as paid off as he was, that's all he was doing was making money on the deal. He didn't care if I went or lose. As a matter of fact, he said that he wouldn't appeal it. I always told him, I says, I says, it's good enough if we lose to appeal it to a higher court. Pizza wouldn't do it. He would not appeal it. You know, they think that I should have to stay down there in Granby. I should have kept my muffler shop going. I should have put up with all the dust, all the, the snickers. Uh, you know, the, the, the town council, I'd pass them in the post office, and they'd snicker at me after they knew I lost. On the street, Casey Farrell, what a barbarian. He comes across being one of those good guys. He's part of the problem. They knew what they were doing. They were trying to run him out of town. The town had a hard on for Marv Hemeyer. They didn't stop and think. Marv didn't have any malice towards us. This is a sign to not do this. No, they kept it in their heart and hearts and said, we'll get him. They started getting me in 1992 when they kept me off the sanitation district. 
They started getting me when Gus Harris sold the property to Cody Dochev. They got me when they issued the, the building permit to Cody Dochev for the concrete plant and denied that it was for the concrete plant. Are we all stupid? Come on, they knew. And when I would ask them these questions, you, which you won't find in the minutes, they would just shut right up, they'd stonewall you. They didn't have an answer. I'd, 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 I'd shoot the truth in their face and they couldn't deal with it. And, and I'm sorry, they're going to have to deal with it. I guarantee you, I am going to make them deal with it. The battle with the town of Granby, you know, um, we talked about it, but I didn't get that feeling that he was so angry. No one realized how, how uh, distorted it was becoming to him. Marv was feeling defeated, humiliated, and at his wit's end about what he's going to do. He goes out, sits in his hot tub with the beer in his hand, and has inspiration. When I was sitting in the hot tub, and I mean, I was, I was weeping. And a peace came over me where I knew God wanted me to do it. And I didn't understand. I said, why did you ask me to do this? Is that why I've never been married? So I didn't have a family? Is that why I've always been successful? So that I would realize my reward before doing this task? But it has to be done. And the world will write stories about how wrong I am. And without a doubt, I wish it could be done a different way. But there is no way to make this right. You picked on the wrong man. Clay, do you remember the first time you met Marv at that auction? Yeah, uh, me and Gus went to the sale auction in Denver. Uh, that was on the two acres in the shop. Right. But did you talk? You talked to Marv afterwards, right? After the auction or during the auction? Did you talk to him? No. There's the difference of points of view or memory about what happened after Marv got it. Cody Dochev, I mean, this guy's just a fucking asshole. Come back and just introduced himself by giving me a tongue lashing for about 10 minutes. I don't think I even met Marv that yeah. Me and Gus just got up and walked out after we're done. The reason I ask is that Marv claims that uh, you guys talked afterwards. Uh, I don't believe we talked to talk. No. I mean, I talked to this guy forever, it seems like. Uh, they give everybody around me, they couldn't believe this asshole. I mean, this is the only guy of all the properties that sold before his that was doing any screaming at anybody during the auction. Gus doesn't remember it either. I uh, have been a school bus driver for 50 years. Cody has been a good friend for many, many years. We have gone to auctions together before and times. So Cody went with me, but he had no part in the, in the auction. Cody and I sat and, li and listened to a, another bid or two. There really wasn't much of anything happened. Uh, I don't know what Marv did. I wasn't paying any attention to him, really. And then we just got up and, and uh, left, yeah. Cody would uh, maybe be interested in the property at a, at a future time, but uh, there was no agreement or talk between us of him owning that property. Cody would have been mad at anybody who would have bought the property, anybody. But, but you gotta go there with enough money. Otherwise, you're the problem. It's your fault that this happened, not mine. Marv in his tapes, the way he characterizes the town, me and many other people, just did not reflect what I thought was the way those people really were and really are. I wasted 13 years of my life down there because the Thompsons were pissed off that I bought that property. 
We lived here all of our life. We was born and raised here. Probably going to die here, so <laughs> where else is she going to go? But No, our dad started here in business in 1949. We had our mom, our dad, and then we had another brother between the two of us that got sick in 02, and he passed away. And everybody has their hearts yet, so we had more in our fair share. <laughs> a raft of a them. A raft of them. The popular conception of the Thompson brothers is that they're the hardest working millionaires in the county. They probably could live well off of the revenue from their property that they have in Granby. They could probably hire people, but they don't. They choose to work, and I actually think they like the work. We got a whole yard full of stuff. We don't hire any help. We just do it ourselves. It's fun. So it keeps us out of trouble. So. I spent one day here in the spring of 2003. The Thompson brothers were down below my house here in Grand Lake, digging a foundation for a house. Larry Thompson was standing up by his truck by himself, so I drove up to him and had a few words with him. Basically, what I told him was that, you know, Larry, you know, about in 1992, your family financially affected my life for the rest of my life. Well, Mark had a beef with our dad because he was on the town board, town council for a lot of years, and in the last years of his life, he was the mayor. And I says, you owe me. And I says, I want $300,000 from you. And he says, it'll never happen. And I says, well, I says, I guarantee you, Larry, I'm going to collect. One day, we always was friendly to him, you know, and he rolled his window down. He says, I'm going to get you guys, and rolled his window up and left. And that was the last time we ever talked to him. He basically confirmed in my mind right there that he knew what I was talking about and he knew what had been done because he had one thing to say. He screamed it at me as I'm about five truck lengths away. He screamed, you can suck my dick. Well, when someone is that frustrated that they've got to say something like that, you know they know. It was all politics related, so... I don't think anybody ever done him wrong on purpose. You never know what gets into people. He's a cowardly bastard. He's a Catholic. And I think they are some of the biggest cowards I have ever met. They believe the only way that they can stay on top is to keep their neighbor down. Well, I think that Marv might have seen in the Thompson family an example of what he may have really aspired to which was being a relatively wealthy, land-owning family that worked with their hands, worked with heavy equipment, that were able to make a living at it and be successful. This is my die-cast toy collection. I've probably been collecting 15 years now, maybe a little longer. And this is kind of my hobby that I do in the evenings, mainly in the wintertime. So I just buy one, two toys once in a while as I can afford it. Is this your favorite truck? They're all favorite trucks. <laughs> They're our toys. <laughs> so, but anyway. I went down to talk to Marv about uh, his business and whether he'd like us to do a new business story and would he like to buy some advertising. And Marv was only open at select hours. Marv ran that business so he could indulge his snowmobiling habit. But I must have gone back down to the muffler shop three, four times, and Marv was never there. This newspaper guy, Patrick Flatter, this guy hated me. When I first came up here in 91, uh, he said that he was going to come down and we'd do an article on my little business. Well, he never did do it. You know, he was doing everything he could to keep me from getting any additional publicity. He knows how to abuse the power of the pen. And that's a big thing up here, is abuse of power. When the time came where I ran into Marv, he was all upset with me for never doing a story. I said, Marv, why don't I just give you an ad? You know, I took a photo of Marv and ran a free ad for him. It was, I think, a $200 ad that he got for nothing. I know the newspaper guy. That guy has told so many lies. It's one thing about lying. You tell a lie, usually you got to tell five more to cover that up. I came to Granby in 78, three kids raised here, bought the store in 92. 
we try to be part of the community and support the community because they support us. So that's how I got kind of involved in the town board thing. Casey Farrell, what a barbarian. He comes across being one of those good guys. He's part of the problem. Casey and Rhonda Farrell and their family are the kind of people you want for neighbors. He never did anything with ill intent. He never did anything with malice. The town council, I'd pass them in the post office, and they'd snicker at me after they knew I lost. In that batch plant, I felt like it was a positive, and I couldn't see a downside for Marv. It was going to supply concrete so the community could grow, the opportunity for jobs. I mean, he might get a little dust on his muffler shop, but it wasn't all I cleaned to begin with. How many times do you have to try to deal with a man? Come on, Cody, be reasonable. But that's what you cannot do with people in the mountains, especially in Grady. Cody Dochev built his concrete business from the ground up. He's what I would call kind of a salt of the earth businessman who uh, is a doer, he's a hard worker. Maybe Marv and Cody had some head butting just because they're both alpha personalities or something of that nature. I think they're both pretty good at what they do. Neither one of them were trust fund babies. Cody's worked hard to get where he's at. Cody's Cody's Cody. <laughs> it's just his nature. He's just his nature. Yeah. You know, he just he tells you the way it is. If you don't like it, he just, <laughs> he just tells you. Tell you, you know. Yeah. He's a good guy. He know he'd do anything for you, but he's just Got a little short fuse, goes off, but he's okay. Oh, yeah. He you know? has a little bit of a temper, but he's, he's, he's all right. He's all right, you know. He is a, a little Bulgarian. He's quite quick. He's a good man. He's done all right around here. Works his butt off like everybody else. Yeah, he, he's earned it. Yeah, he's earned every, every nickel he made. He came here with basically with nothing. nothing. Uh, Mav and Cody probably could have been friends. For years, I tried to appease Cody Dochev's misguided anger. I bought every bit of concrete, which turned out to be shit. Marv complained about the sewer board holding him over a barrel, but that was completely standard procedure. It's true that it can be expensive, but Cody connected when he built the batch plant, and it would not cost much for Marv to have hooked on. The Dochas called up Marv and said, Marv, we'll give you an easement for your water and sewer if you drop your lawsuit against the town and us. Marv just hung up when he was called into the court because he hadn't connected his sewer lines. He's clearly stalling on resolving this issue. This is where Marv confronts Deb Hess, who is a town clerk. So, Deb, did you have any dealings with Marv? He had come in my office because he was accusing me of going over the bank and bad-mouthing him. And I said, Mr. Emeyer, I wasn't over at the bank, and I wouldn't do that. I mean, I have no reason to bad-mouth him. I just said I just need a different check. Actually, he had made a mistake when he wrote out the amount. Marv corrects the verbiage on the check, and then the check clears, and he's paid his fine. Marv's anger affected his interpretation of events with Dietz as well. He believed Dietz milked him for money and abandoned him on appeal. But if Dietz was really out to milk Emeyer, why didn't he go to the appeal? It'd just be a way to milk another 55,000 out of him. And the irony is, Cody had been offering to buy Marv out from the beginning. And Marv saw an opportunity to sell that two-acre parcel that he had bought at that auction to the Dochefs. Marv put a price on his property of $250,000. That's a pretty good profit, six times what he paid for it. Cody agreed to 250000 Immediately, Marv backed out and said, nope, I want 375. Cody said, all right, we'll pay that. Marv backed out again. I'm not sure if Marv was looking for a fight at that point in time. He had a way out. He had a way out to make some good money and, and go on about his life. But he chose that path for whatever reason. At the town level, the people on there are just everyday people that want to give back and to say that the people that sit behind us in this boardroom do things for any other reason than trying to make a difference and trying to do what's right, they're sadly mistaken. He was raising hell about Cody and the batch plant. And Marv actually made that 
better for the town because he was raising issues that the people on the board that hadn't thought about. So he'd come in and he'd say, well, what about dust or this or that or whatever? We'd go, well, that makes sense to me. What do you think, Cody? Oh yeah, I can fix that, no big deal. So we really got a better deal for the town because of Marv complaining. Well, after we approved it, it was actually, I, th I felt like it was a pretty damn good deal, really. Marv's assumption that there was this group of community leaders that would get together at the coffee shop in the morning and conspire about how to keep Marv from moving forward because he's the new guy. It's patently untrue. He was upset. He wanted to have it his way, and it wasn't going to go his way. Marv went to California, probably based on an advertisement he saw in a Ritchie Brothers auction site for this Kumatsu D355 bulldozer. Marv bid on it and got it at a great deal. It's a big dozer. Yeah, big dozer. He then stuck it on a flatbed, had it driven all the way to Granby, Colorado from California, and had it delivered in July of 2002. We're sitting there eating dinner one night, and this big yellow truck comes in town with this big dozer on it. We sat down there and watched him load that thing off the trailer. But we were working the next county up, and it was midnight or 1 in the morning before we got back to our warehouse. But we took the back way, and they're unloading that dozer that night. It's just really strange. That thing is a pretty good-sized tractor. We thought, what in the heck is he going to do with that goddamn thing, you know? He ended up parking the dozer up on the access road to the uh, muffler property so that the blade was facing out on this dirt road. And he had right in the middle of the blade a for sale sign. And it just sat there through that winter of 2002 to 2003. He parked Kamatsu outside the muffler shop just to make Dochev nervous. That's why he bought it, for the intimidation factor. I wanted these people to learn. And he knew that I eventually would get to the point where I wouldn't put up with what they were taking away from me for what they had denied me. God knew Marv Hemeyer very well. Essentially, he becomes the victim that is then justified in reacting against all these people that have done him wrong. We know he wants to get out of there. We know he knows he's screwed. Let's really screw him, you know? That's exactly what their attitude was, and, and they did. I had no choice. What was I supposed to do? The allegation is that somehow the town ruined Marv's business. The town didn't do anything to shut him down. He still had access to his property. Marv, just on his own, decided to completely shut down his muffler shop and put it all up to auction. You know, God has his timing, his plans made out, and it looks like it's going to be. Because the one thing that I have wanted to do is get caught. I had hoped that somebody would catch me and that this whole thing would stop. And that would be a good sign for me not to do it. So Marv conducted the auction of all the materials relating to his shop. Included in the items he was going to auction was this dozer. This Komatsu was in excellent condition. I was willing at the auction to take 33000 for it. Couldn't get a bit. So I kept the dozer. And it also is unique how I had five things at the auction, and they sold. But what two things did I keep? the Komatsu dozer and the property. If they would have bought it at that auction for 450000 I would have walked away. But there wasn't one bid. So, so stop and think about this. I wasn't supposed to walk away from this because the Komatsu was still there. You know, I had quit smoking for nine years, and then I become this closet smoker. You know, I'd sneak them, which is ridiculous, I know. And he, uh, he didn't like that. 
we got into an argument about it. That's when things went downhill. And then we quit seeing each other. It was maybe easier to, to break it up, you know? I don't know the details, but just him talking about her. He was very in love with her. I knew that. Is it possible that he felt stronger about you than you did him? Marv was still perplexed about what to do with his property. Travis Bussey and his partner were owners of the trash company. They had negotiated with Marv to lease his two acres as a staging point for their trucks. And I was trying to look for an area where it was more commercial, that I could actually had a garage, that I could keep my trucks in the winter. He had the perfect building right there in town. What was unique is I find out that the dozer is two inches shorter than 12 feet, one inch narrower than the door. So I said, well, let's put it inside, because then I can build it to do what I am supposed to do. The Komatsu just barely fit through the door. Why did that particular dozer fit in the building? Why had I not bought one of the D9s at that Fresno auction? So, so I'm thinking, well, this is good. I get it inside, now I can build it. Must be what I'm supposed to do. At that time, we were getting bigger, and we needed a place to where we could call home. Travis finally offered Marv $400,000 and Marv agreed to sell the land to them for that amount. Sure enough, I think it was even within 24 hours, Travis had water and sewer hooked up to the property. We bought it all, and he basically back-rented from us the building that he put the dozer in. And this will be the first time that I've ever done something like that, the way they want it to be done, the way they do it, to do it in secret, to do things behind their back, to lie to you. I've had to do that. People ask me, what am I doing? Oh, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I spent 2003 in that friggin' building, lived there without a shower for as much as four days at a time, working on that dozer, getting it prepared. Marv built a little sleeping area, complete with cot, TV, hot plate, water, so that he could basically work 24-7 on the dozer. He ended up bringing in all the sheets of steel into the shed. He had torches in the shed. He had all kinds of tools in the shed. He built a lift, which could lift large, heavy things, mainly sheets of steel. It actually lifted them up and held them in place while he welded them in place. It was half-inch steel. He had spacers that he put in, so he had two layers of steel plate and he poured concrete down in between them. And then lifted the outer shell of that dozer. So that made it a super fortified cab. He was working on it at night, sleeping during the day, so. But you think somebody would know what was going on down there, but evidently. And he put in surveillance cameras on the outside of the shed, hooked up to monitors he had on inside the shed. I think he kind of watched us and our schedule, so he knew that basically when we left at five or six at night, he was free to work and make noise. I don't understand it. I guess I'm a dumb, I'm a dumb person. I'm not as witty as some, I'm not as sharp as some. I don't know that that's the backbone of America, though. You know, I don't know what the backbone of America is anymore. I did my buying that property. People, you are make so mistaken about the real world. You know, you can call it revenge. Maybe and maybe I don't know. Maybe what happens here, maybe you'll remember that. Marv knew he was going to be spending long periods of time in the shed, and he had in there a little small video collection that he could watch. One of the movies he had in there was a Van Diesel film called A Man Apart. The hero of the movie loses his wife to a gang of criminals. He takes the law into his own hands, goes out there, shoots up the bad guys, and the movie ends with him alone, but he has somehow redeemed and purified the corrupt society. When we purchased the property, we had to have insurance on every building, so we had to actually do a walkthrough through that building. <laughs> Last fall, I had this dozer about half done. Had the dozer covered up with these polypropylene tarps. So these guys come in, 
oh, well, what's this? I made up this story. I said this professor was perfecting cooling system, which would cool the air and increase the performance of the engine. I, I had this all bullshit story, and they went along with it. I, I couldn't believe it when they walked out the door. It was right there under their nose. How come they didn't catch me? Well, I wasn't supposed to get caught. God built me to be here to prove to you that what you have been doing for God knows how many years is wrong. You picked on the wrong man. I'm not tough. I'm not that strong. What I'm going to do is above me. And God gave me that peace years ago in that hot tub. I had to do this, that I could not do it without God's help, that it was his strength that would spur me on at, at 51 and 52 years old to get this job done at the pace that I could do it. And I believe that is why he gave me last winter off. He says, Mark, if you're not going to get it done, go take off this winter, go play. You know, it's winter time. I'm not going to be here. Everything's sold. I don't have a muffler shop anymore. I'm going to go snowmobiling. actually really did succeed in Granby. He bought that property for $42,000. He was able to sell it 10 years later for $400,000. And in fact, that was the very thing he had been trying to do all along. Marv says in his own tapes that his muffler business was successful and gave him an opportunity to do what he wanted to do in life, to enjoy his snowmobiling and still have money so he could live. But you've got to do this. You've got to get this done. And that was my goal, so to speak. Take the winter off, relax. You know, maybe something would come up to change my mind. In March of 2004, Marv's father dies. Marv did go up to the funeral. He took photos. In the photos, you see family members, you see photos of Marv's father in the casket. Included was a selfie that Marv took outside the family farm there in South Dakota. And it's a mournful, sad looking photo. A look of resignation is on Marv's face. It's almost as if he's saying, I know what I'm gonna do and I'm not happy about it. And this is my last look at my home. But before that, Marv had given all the proceeds from the sale of the lot and of all of his material and equipment to his father. You know, it's gone, because now money means nothing to me. I've given my house away. I do not need this cabin here in Grand Lake. My snowmobiles, I've given those away this year. Everything is gone. What I own is just going to be a pittance compared to what I'm going to take. Marv transferred the sale proceeds from his bank in $50,000 increments. Prior to his father's passing, his father conveyed those sale proceeds to Marv's two brothers and sister. By giving them to his father and willing all that to the other members of the family, it was one big step removed from Marv so that when the time came to try to get resources back from Marv to reimburse people who had lost, uh, it was near impossible. This is tape three. It's about 10.05 on uh, the 13th of April, 2004. I want to say that I believe that I am an American patriot. I believe in the free enterprise system. I believe in the level playing field of competition. 
If you want to change that level playing field of competition to your advantage, basically you give me license to do that also when my opportunity comes around. Because you are the leaders of the community. Through your actions, you show the community how things are supposed to be done. You have given me license through your example to do what I need to do. When I do this, that levels the playing field in my favor. So now we've got a lopsided playing field because when I come back at you, I'm going to destroy your side of the playing field. He wanted everybody to hear what he felt about what happened to him, but I won't even listen to him, you know. I listened a little bit, and I said, nah, I don't need to listen to this, you know. He told me in his roundabout way through life, you know. Lonely man. He was just spent too much time alone. That's what I put it off to. He spent too much time in hot tub alone. At the time, I went to work for a dentist. We ended up doing a crown prep on Marv, and he was to come back that actual Friday and seat the permanent crown. I said, Marv, you need to get the hell out of Grand County. I remember it vividly. And he gave me a big hug and he said, Trish, he said, you are the best thing that ever happened to me in Grand County. I just remember that so vividly. And you know, he was going to do this thing three weeks later. He already had a plan, you know. It's so nuts to think about that. And I would never have guessed. You know, he seemed like it was so great to see him and, and it was great to have a hug, you know. I went snowmobiling with Marvin a month before it happened. Early May on Vail Pass, just he and I. We had plans of going again in June just to say we did it. And these are future plans. He wasn't done. Then he spent a couple weeks in Florida with some friends. He talked about it on the way to Vail. He said they were going to get what's coming to him. So here we are, and I am at peace with what I am about to do. People will say, why did he do that? He had such a good life. He had a better life than me anyway. It's not what I deserve. You meddled in my business and took what I deserve away. You took advantage of my good nature. Well, I think there's something you should learn here. For as good as a man can be, also can he be as bad. When you visit evil upon someone, be assured it will revisit you. The Thompsons are guilty. The Dochefs are guilty. The Granby Town Board is guilty. The Granby Planning Commission is guilty. It took all of you 10 years to get me. You got me, no doubt about it. I got screwed big time. Enough is enough. I have been beaten to a point where I'm not going to take it anymore. But I don't think that's what God had planned for me. And he expects me to do something to those who kept me now from getting what I deserve. God's will be done through me. You were cowards in the way that you dealt with me. You all along were thinking that I was the person that needed to be taught a lesson. You were going to show me how it worked in Grand Colorado, how the real world worked. You people needed to be taught a lesson.
Um, this is Jerry at the Trash Company. Uh -huh. And there is a bulldozer over at Mount Pleasant Concrete destroying their building. It's destroying the building? Okay. Yes. Is anyone on it? Yeah, it's all encased in metal, and you can't see who's driving or anything. Yeah, they can't get it to stop. Marcia came across the radio. She was screaming. She said, Cody, Cody. And I went running over. Then he just turned the dozer and headed for the match. 911, what is your emergency? Hi, this is Terry with the Crab Company again. Yeah. It is headed for their main building right now. Headed for the main building, okay. Cody had grabbed a handgun from one of his workers. Bob Howard gave it to me. He said, be careful, it's loaded. I said, good. He takes the gun up and bang, bang. Not only is the diesel engine screaming as it's pushing the dozer, but the treads, they're creaking and scraping. There's the roar of the engine. And then there's just the sound of crash and ruin because he's really knocking all these walls down. The tracks are probably the most memorable thing. Our goal was to get the heaviest thing we could pack by hand because if you can get tangled up in some steel, you're going to stop that track. We got a big piece of angle iron off of Cody Dochef's steel rack. It was probably half inch diameter, so it was really heavy. Our intentions was, was to try to lodge that into the tracks and get it tangled up so it'd break the track. That didn't work. Then I tried getting up on the machine, the ripper, the back end of it. What was I gonna do? I don't know. I kept sliding up. I couldn't get up there. I kept sliding up. It was full of, like, Vaseline, grease. What are you going to do, try to stop each other? We have an armored, very armored situation at St. Gozer. Yeah, when I come here, there's an armored bulldozer chain on the building. There are several deputies in route. At the time of the call, which was about quarter after two in the afternoon, I was approximately a mile away. I pulled up and stopped my car, and there's a bulldozer that doesn't completely look like a bulldozer anymore. I had grabbed a shotgun and ran towards the bulldozer. I'm yelling. I'm ordering it to stop. It backs away from the building, and a front-end loader approaches it, and I see the front-end loader is being operated by Cody Docha. I told Cody, get the biggest loader you got and see if you can't get underneath his track to uplift him. And Cody did. He backed up with a big loader and hit him. So he takes his front-end loader and slams into the side of it. I went up to into his track. They said, raise him up, raise him up. I kept raising him. He's so heavy, I only had one tire left on the ground. The other one's about three foot up in the air. And all it did was lift the back of the front end loader up. I slipped off. When he backed out, he was backing out in the middle of the yard there. I went to get him again. When I hit him, they said, my wheels went off the ground by four feet. I didn't see all of that happen, because when I hit him, my head hit the windshield. I was out. It shook him hard enough that I think that's when Marv started letting out the rounds. Marv had a 50 caliber rifle pointed out the back. He shot numerous rounds into Cody's bucket. We have shot We had automatic weapons the bulldozer. All I could see is dust coming out the bucket. Luckily, all the rounds hit the bucket. Cody figures out where he is, and he's not hit, he's OK, and he backs up, and he thinks, what am I going to do now? Shortly after that, Cody realized that that was too much. He was done. That's when the officers started surrounding the place. And I transitioned from a shotgun to an M4 rifle. And about that time, I was joined by a state trooper, Dave Patura. At first, Cody speculated that there's not a human being in there. It's being run by radio controls. I said, it's Marv Emar. They said, how do you know it's Emar? I said, I know it is. I said, I don't think nobody's in that building. I said, I think it's radio control. He's got to be on one of these hills around here someplace. The dozer is continuing its damage, just going in and out of the building, slamming into this huge concrete batch plant, essentially knocking down all the side walls, just destroying it. Well, at this point, there's more police on the scene. Okay, I'm going to pull right up behind the building. Come back around the corner. I came in on the west side of the batch plant, bailed out of the vehicle, pulled my rifle out, and I could hear the squeaking of the tracks and, and the roaring of the engine and the banging into the building, but it, I still didn't see anything. Once I got close to the building around skirting an irrigation ditch, 
Marv come around the building in that bulldozer, and that's when I got my first look of it. I don't know, I expected to see a bulldozer. It looks like a tank. There's this huge black monstrosity. I mean, almost like a World War I big boxy rumbly tank. And then the next thing you're thinking is, how do, you, how do you attack something like this? How do I stop this? When I arrived on scene, I could hear the bulldozer operating. I walked around my vehicle and saw this absolute behemoth. Sergeant Rich Garner was our designated marksman. And I just started shooting, trying to aim for what looked like a viewport. We made the decision to begin firing at the small portholes that we could see in the side of this bulldozer. But they were maybe two inches by four inches at the very most. What I didn't know was that these portholes were covered with two sheets of half-inch Lexan, which had me wondering how he was actually driving this thing. Garner stands there and uh, takes a few shots at the dozer, then all of a sudden, bang, bang. I had two rounds go right by my head, and I was like, oh, I know what that noise is. Marv fired his weapons, and he fired at a bunch of cops that were standing behind a wall of jersey barriers. You know, as we started firing, and of course the rounds were having absolutely no effect, he saw three state troopers behind a stack of Jersey barriers that were next to the building. Instead of just going on by them, he turned and drove directly at those Jersey barriers. If those troopers hadn't moved, he'd have probably killed all three of them. started proceeding eastbound through the parking lot in the construction area. I had parked my vehicle on the south side of the building. At that time, Marv moved back around the south side of the building, and Glenn Trainer's unmarked vehicle was over there. He put the blade up against that and started pushing it. He kept pushing it sideways, sideways. Well, then it caught the rims on the wheels and actually stopped it and started flipping over, and he rolled over the top of it. As he was heading towards the highway, somebody notified me on the radio that the person operating the bulldozer was Marvin Heemeyer. He was not gonna stop at just the concrete plant. I don't think that just knowing what I'm doing is enough. I think God will bless me to get the machine done, to drive it, to do the stuff that I have to do up to a point, and then you're either gonna blow me right off the fucking streets, I'm gonna have a heart attack and die, the machine's gonna break, or maybe, maybe it'll go all day and I'll run out of fuel. I got a lot of fuel in that thing, let me tell you. To do what I believe needs to be done, what God has inspired me to do. I am the co-captain of my life. God is first, I am second. You have tried to control my life. You have tried to be the captain of my life. You do not run my life. You do not determine what I desire, what I want, what I deserve. I determine that, and my God determines that. Not you people. No people do that. If they do, then you're a slave to them. I am not a slave to man. I am a slave to God. As he was heading towards the highway, I began sending notifications, having my deputies and supervisors go out and begin evacuating the town. That's when Glenn decided he was going to try to get up on top of it. I got the idea to climb up and see if, you know, I could actually gain entry. So he's climbing up, and we start running along with him, trying to cover him. I was expecting to see, you know, something with a handle that I could pull up and, and open, and there was absolutely nothing. You know, it was solid sheet metal from the front to the back. The only thing I did see up there was there was some kind of a, a vent where it looked like there was like an RV air conditioner. 
he takes his pistol out and starts trying to shoot into some gaps where the air conditioner was. Of course, it does no good, but then he's up there and he's just riding along on this thing. So when then we start coming up with maybe getting some flashbangs. I brought some flashbangs. If anybody needs them, this is 35. I'm throwing up these flashbangs, and Glenn's pulling the pin on them and dumping them down the exhaust. And of course, they're going on. Boom. Big cloud of smoke and everything come out. No effect. It moves out of the immediate little industrial area, and the next building that it hits is Mountain Parks Electric. At the time of my tenure on the board, I worked at Mountain Parks Electric. So I don't know if there was some interplay there. He spent several minutes just going in, doing the damage, backing out, going in, backing out, the entire time of which I'm sitting up there watching this going on. Knowing all along that he was on his way to the Granby Town Hall, that was the next place he went. And that the town hall was upstairs, but our public library was downstairs in the same building. And there were kids and other people inside the library. Midday, I had my lunch break. I did start hearing um, what I thought, I mean, it sounded like gunfire. And then I started seeing police cars like flying by at high rates of speed. I started hearing sirens. I was hearing more gunfire. And at that point, I decided to go back to the library. We issued a directive to have a reverse 911 call sent out to the community to shelter in place. Because after the first one, we were just thinking, barricade everyone inside, not knowing that we were a target, that there was a bulldozer heading right there. And then a, shortly after that, we got another call, a 911 reverse call. They were telling everyone, evacuate your building now. It took me until that moment to realize that my 11-year-old daughter was in the basement of that building in the library. The bulldozer came out onto the highway and pulled off and drove right into the lawn area of the town hall. I elected to, to get off at that point and did jump down. Marv works his way up around and goes around the back of the town hall, destroying the children's playground in the process, turning all the little jungle gyms and swing sets into just curled, twisted spaghetti in the backyard there. But we did gather up the kids and then we drove them all to their houses. We got there, turned the radio on, and as soon as we turned it on, within seconds, we heard the radio announcer say that he had just bulldozed Town Hall. The dozer methodically tore apart Town Hall. From the Town Hall, it went back out to Main Street. We had this rolling roadblock out in front of him. The patrol units and then behind him as well. Somewhere during that time, Norm Rimmer shows up and he sees this camera sticking out the back. Then we start looking around and we see another one. That's when we figured out that's how he was steering it, was using the cameras. Marv placed around the outside of the dozer five cameras. They had them mounted to three monitors inside the tank, so he had views of the back, front, and the sides. He actually thought ahead enough that there would be debris and dust, so he rigged all these little hoses to a compressed air tank that's in the cab. And he was able to open the compressed air to blow dust and debris in front of this Lexan so he could still see where he was going. As it's going down the highway, more and more law enforcement officers were showing up, people coming from home. I started hearing gunfire and sirens from my home. So I got my police radio, started listening to the traffic, and I heard officers describing being shot at and something about a bulldozer knocking buildings down. I thought the best thing to do at the time was to grab my camcorder. So I followed him around until he got to uh, Sky High News. This guy may possibly be going after Patrick for hour. It was a regular news day. We were working when one of the sheriff's deputies tells me, get out of here, you're on the list. And I said, what? He then leaves the building. And there's this large kind of gray, dark monolith driving down the road with two police cars on either side. Right when he gets by the front of the building, it takes a sharp right turn. The ground starts to shake. You can hear the creaking of the treads. And we were inside the building here and blam, knocks down the front wall of the building. are leaving out the back of the building as Marv is driving through the front of the building. The ground is literally shaking under your feet. It's 85 tons that are just rolling impervious 
Well, we immediately start running out the back. Marv continues to take the dozer back and smashes in the front of the building and works his way around. He just kept backing up, knocking cars out of his way, taking a hit at the building, backing up again, taking another hit at it. Literally, the ceiling's caving in all around us. I run out the back door with my camera around my neck and run up the side of the building. There's a sheriff's deputy there with a shotgun. I snap off a panicked photo, and then I start hearing gunfire. I hear a few whizzes over my head, and I think, this is stupid. I'm getting out of here. And then finally, the entire building just collapsing around itself. There was a lot of metal on metal screeching going on, especially when he's pushing cars out of the way. There was a lot of screeching noises from the treads. And it was just kind of overwhelming, you know, looking at it and realizing, you know, I don't have a way of stopping this. None of us had a way of stopping it. The dozer goes down to the east end of town. They knew that we were on the hit list, so they hurried up up here, and we came across the flats up here behind the town shop, and the county cop stopped us. He says, you're not going any farther. We go, yeah, we are. You get your ass down here and arrest me at home if you want to. We're getting, we're going down the hill. That's the Thompson residence. All those are headed there. We need to have everybody evacuated out of the Thompson's residence. There's a, a little house owned by Thompsons, and their mother lives there. I called her, and she thought I was joking with her. I said, you need to get in the car. Just drive out of town. Just get out of there. Marvin Hemeyer is around Thompson's shop. The chief of Kremlin PD showed up, rolls his window down, and said, hey, Rich, I got a surprise for you. In the back seat is this big, huge 50 cal silhouette gun. And I picked up the gun, and I would let loose with it. effect. Boy well, came down the back street here, knocked some trees down. The dozer ran right through the house. It completely leveled the house. She did get out safely. My only concern was her. Thelma Thompson was asleep in the house only 30 minutes before Marv completely destroyed their home. It started to destroy a uh, construction yard that's owned by Thompson and Sons systematically destroying that area. And then he turned and came over to the shop here, and we had a Lobo trailer sitting out here, and he shoved it through the wall. Then he went down the street down here and tipped over another semi-trailer we had. He, he flat laid it over on its side full of truck parts. And then he went around the front of our house and shoved the XL Energy pick through our rental building. Meanwhile, this whole ridge is up here was just covered with people following him through town, watching what he was doing, like a circus. And then after that, it looked like a war zone out here, all the helicopters flying around and all the news trucks showing up. And that's when he headed off down the hill and went down to Independent Gas. Hey, would you make a general broadcast? All units should evacuate at least a 1,000 feet back from the propane tanks at Independent Gas. I was on top of the hill looking down on that. All I saw was rows and rows of propane tanks of various sizes. You know, we're not talking camping propane. We're, we're talking about, you know, industrial-sized propane tanks. If you're standing in the farm looking up the hill, you can see a, a senior citizen's home, a trailer park, private residences. There were a lot of homes, a lot of people in a blast area. Marv was by the propane from shooting at the tanks. He was using incendiary rounds, so they made kind of a flash and a puff of smoke. One of those bullets could easily hit a propane tank and ignite it immediately. There would have been a lot of damage. You see these things flying through the air, landing on homes. The advised player's got a 50 cal. He's trying to take out the tanks and uh, transformers and independent propane at this time. He had a ripper on the back end of the bulldozer. And when he would try to maneuver it to get the barrel of the gun pointing towards the propane tanks, 
the Ripper was digging into the ground and not going down far enough to allow his armor to get out of the way. And the 50 caliber was hitting his own armor. And you can see the shells hitting the armor and then bursting into a puff of smoke and flame when they hit his own armor. While one of his bullets did penetrate a power transformer, none of them penetrated the actual propane tanks. Grand to also be advised Federal Heights is going to be en route with their Peacekeeper on a flatbed. Uh, ETA about two hours, and Summit County is also en route with a flatbed. Ask them to help us get the National Guard unit in here, maybe with a helicopter to stop this unit. Confirm you need a National Guard unit and a helicopter? You know, the uh, International Guard uh, or Army National Guard, uh, either out of Wyoming or out of Eagle. And then that's when the county scraper tried to stop him. Yeah, we're going to try to bring uh, the scrapers down Highway 40. We'll let them know where they need to go. We had asked for a bulldozer from our Road and Bridge Department. The director of Grand County Road and Bridge was a guy by the name of Clark Brandstetter. Also, oh, Brandstetter on Road and Bridge, and I got a scraper in front of what the A&W used to be on 40, where he wanted to put this. What he did do is bring in two big earth movers or scrapers from the landfill. Well, let's get him up here just as fast as we can. Clark Branstetter actually tried to stop the bulldozer at the top of the hill going back up onto the highway. Uh, we're going to contact you today to get a CA cat that is completely armored with iron, armored over all vital components, including a compartment with only some cuts to fire out of some hard places. The bulldozer just basically moved this scraper just right out of the way. He went back up the hill, back on the main street again. We're at 4th and Main, or 4th and Agus now. Somewhere right in that time frame, it appears that he loses all his antifreeze. There's a big white puff of what would be the antifreeze hitting hot metal components from the engine, and there's a lot of white smoke steam. I copy people smoking heavily at Fourth and Agate. He damaged copycat printers a bit while he's positioning to get his bulldozer facing towards the gamble store. You know, he said, well, he's headed for gambles. Oh, you know, I don't remember how the verbiage was. And I just, my stomach just, like, just like a ball, just clenched. Because I knew my life was going to be completely different. The engine of the bulldozer began overheating. I was across the street watching as it came up the street and then watched as it turned in to go down the side of the Gamble store. You could also tell that he's starting to lose power at this time. And then it starts methodically just tearing apart that Gamble store. He begins going down the side of it, basically trying to rip the entire side of the building off. The county had gotten a belly scraper out. They pulled that in behind to block his way. Having worked in the Gamble store, I knew what a lot of people didn't know, and that's that there was a basement in there. So he took a run at Gamble's, not realizing that the right-hand side track would go into the basement, and that left him stuck, unable to move. This is the first time he's actually stopped and the machine shut down. But we don't know what he's doing. So we pulled everybody back. Before I confirm your location. Right now, the dozer is at Gambles, or what used to be Gambles. It Gambles, 16 One of the radio transmissions of the time is, get ready for a gunfight, because where else are we going with this? It just figures we've gone this far, 
now it's, you know, does somebody pop out of it? Does it just fire from its position? We started to pair up people and get some tactical advantage. It was a short time after that, a gunshot was heard. A couple sheriff's deputies actually got on top of it and were trying to figure out if there was something they could do, some way they could get in. You know, they had the same luck that I had, which is none. Some SWAT teams came up from other jurisdictions and attempted to breach the bulldozer with an explosive charge. And they started blasting on the, on the dozer. All that did was put a, a stain on the side of it. When they triggered that explosive device, it rattled the windows in my house. It was a tremendous, tremendous explosion. They didn't even dent the thing. When the second blast happened, they still didn't get in. They said, if he's not already dead, he, he is now. And they basically just brought a cutting torch up and cut off the access point to this air conditioning unit. Entry was finally gained sometime in the mid-morning of the 5th. Afterwards, we learned that he put the 357 into the roof of his mouth and then pulled the trigger. Since all the cars working perimeters, everybody's still OK. No response means everybody's OK. We all read the sleds up and let his ashes fly away. Everybody couldn't wait to get that dozer cut up, scrap it. I think they made a big mistake by not making a museum out of the thing. It, this made this town a ton of money, a ton of money. They went to Blair's machine shop. He torched the thing into small pieces and disposed of the scrap steel so that no one person could get a hold of it and say, here's my shrine to Mars. This tape's probably got a lot of emotion in it, and uh, anybody listening to it, you know, you need to uh, realize that and just uh, take it from there, you know. Anyway, hey, I hope you all have a great time and good life. I've had a great life, and I'm going to put this tape and tape recorder in a plastic bag so somebody else can try to figure it out. We'll see you later.